Hello lovely people, welcome to the latest instalment of my media analysis series where I use my degree in film history to tell you all about tropes in the media that are dear to my heart and conveniently make me feel like my student loan payments are worth something. Hmm. And they said not to get a film history degree. Also, I get to talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Sure, Joss Whedon is problematic, but Buffy and Faith are my OTP and are 100% canon and you cannot convince me otherwise. I've been looking at media tropes, especially ones relating to disability and LGBTQ plus issues for a couple of years now. So interested in similar videos, I've covered autism, queer coding, OCD, uh, and disability inspiration porn. And I think there's one other, but mm. You can click the card up here for a playlist. This time we'll be looking at a trope that's pretty niche when you think about it, but it's one that's nevertheless somehow earned itself a place in our collective consciousnesses. It's the famous, drumroll please, lesbian vampire. Because why wouldn't you focus disproportionately on the lesbian version of a fictional character? You mean you've never heard of the lesbian hobbit trope? Lesbian werewolf? Lesbian mermaid? No, nothing quite seems to capture the imagination like taking this particular undead folkloric monster, gender-bending it, and then making it gay. And sure, we may be able to find lesbian examples of any kind of character we could choose. That's why we have fan fiction. And nobody's complaining about the representation. Well, maybe we're complaining a bit. But lesbian vampires seem to take things to a whole new level. So we're going to take a little tour through history, the highs and lows of lesbian and bisexual vampires in the media, how they came about and what impact they've had over the years. Spoiler alert, it's uh, complicated. First up, what actually is a vampire? Did high cheekbones, vacant stare and sparkly skin just pop into your mind? <gasps> mm, probably best not to talk about sparkles. How about sharp, gaunt features and pale skin, exquisitely complemented with a black cloak and popped collar, sleeping in coffins, lurking around dark castles and turning into bats to swoop down on their unsuspecting virginal victims? It's elegant, it's spooky, it's, it's even a bit romantic, but it's not actually how vampires were originally imagined. The idea of vampires in folklore actually goes back for thousands of years, although they weren't always called that. Undead demons coming back to life to terrorise and corrupt the living seems to be a common theme in many ancient human societies. And let's be honest, it's not something any of us would be happy to see, even if the fear of them doesn't keep us up at night anymore. But vampires proper swooped into the records around the early 1700s, when the traditions and superstitions of people living in the southeast in Europe were first written down. In these tales, vampires still sucked blood, but were often much more grotesque in appearance. They looked just like you'd imagine a real walking corpse to look, bloated, red and purple, and they were wrapped in the linen shrouds that they would have been buried in, so... Hmm. All of that's just much less appealing. I mean, when you think about it, it's kind of what an undead monster probably should look like. But human imagination really has no bounds. If there's an opportunity to romanticise something unexpected, somebody's going to seize that opportunity. We do it with fan fiction now, and they did it with gothic literature 200 years ago. And that's where we get our image of the gauntly, elegant, and noble vampire. Around the early 1800s, vampire fever took hold all over Europe, with various stories and poems from authors like John Stagg, Lord Byron, and John Polidori securing the romantic notion of aristocratic vampires in all of our minds. Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was published in 1897, is probably the most influential piece of vampire fiction of all. It reinforces the notion that vampires are traditional Transylvanian counts who can shapeshift, mind control their victims and corrupt others, creating new vampires by biting them. Dracula was a predator certainly, but he had a, a certain kind of allure as well, for some reason. Pretty much every vampire that's been depicted in literature, TV and film since then has taken some inspiration from this and other classics at the time, even when the modern concept of a vampire has itself transformed. Whether it's, you know, Sesame Street's adorable Count and Count, Immortal Angel from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or Edward with his insatiable bloodlust in the Twilight series. They're all variations on a theme. I mean, they're all rich, obviously, because A, what else are you going to do if you're alive for centuries but hold generational wealth without having to pay inheritance taxes? And B, blah, blah, it's an allegory for what we let rich aristocratic people get away with or something. It would be easy to assume that the sexualization of these romantic vampires is just another variation, and that the lesbian trope has arisen as a kind of faux-inclusive, extra-titillating sexualization in the same way. But would you believe that the vampiric femme fatales actually predate Dracula? Yes, the lesbians got there first. We won vampires. 
The very first instance of a lesbian vampire in any kind of media actually came during the 1870s, firmly within the era of vampire fever, but a good 25 years before the famous Count Dracula, so. Hmm. Her name was Carmilla, and she was the star of Irish author Sheridan Le Fanu's gothic novella of the same name. Fans of the vampire lesbian trope will recognise the name, yes, since the original story has been an inspiration that's echoed down through the years. In it, the female narrator, Laura, meets and befriends the seemingly normal Carmilla, but notes how the woman likes to keep to herself, first asleep late into the day. Not entirely unreasonable, it is the 1870s, maybe she's just bored. The two grow to be close, at times very close and Carmilla makes unexpected romantic advances towards the young Laura. <gasps> ah, that is unexpected. The extent of these women's relationship may not be stated explicitly, but the writing is certainly on the wall. Things start to take a strange turn though, when Laura finds a portrait of her ancestor, Michala, Countess of Karnstein, that resembles Carmilla exactly. Gosh, what a coincidence. Not long after, Laura dreams of a cat-like beast entering her bedroom and biting her on the breast before mysteriously transforming into Carmilla in a nightdress drenched in blood. <gasps> no next for Carmilla, the breast is most definitely where it's at. In the morning, she has physical marks from the creature in her dream, and her health begins to decline. Oh no! Laura and her father soon hear of another young woman called Bertha, who's su Bertha and Laura, who suffered a similar fate. Bertha meets and falls for a beautiful woman at a ball, this time named Mirala. Yeah, I know, she's amazing at subterfuge. The anagrams of her own name are really throwing us off but she also mysteriously falls ill, and her family soon realise she's being visited by a vampire. After that, the cat-shaped beast is out of the bag, and the group head off to the tomb of Laura's ancestor, where they find and confront Camilla, who apparently has never left her own tomb, ever. Carmilla, Makala, Malaka, whatever her name really is, is eventually vanquished in the traditional vampire way. She staked through the heart, decapitated, and cremated for good measure. It was too late for poor Bertha, who died of her symptoms, and Laura is said to have never properly recovered. Although it wasn't actually stated whether she never recovered from the vampire bite or the lesbian tendencies, so on the one hand, maybe yay. Published in 1872, the story has all of the good stuff of the gothic fiction from that time. But I mean, it also has some elements that seem surprisingly ahead of their time. Perhaps intended to add to the surreal and discomforting atmosphere and make Carmilla himself seem even more threatening. It overturns the classical Victorian notion of women being meek and helpless, and instead places Carmilla, Laura and Bertha as equals, if not superior to the men in the story. The relationships between women in the story show clear emotional, if not sexual investment, and the predatory nature of the vampires doesn't stop at her sexuality. The matter-of-factness of the women's, quote, friendship is refreshing, and Carmilla's refusal to hide in the shadows as a vampire may well be a rejection of closeting notions of the age that kept lesbianism under wraps. However matter-of-fact the Carmilla story may have been as a gothic romance horror, the concept of a lesbian vampire inevitably transformed over the next hundred years. Overtly sexual femme fatales were largely lacking through much of the 20th century, but that all changed when Hammer Horror got their hands on the trope. Famed for their gothic film adaptations in the glorious and gory Technicolor, Hammer Film Productions made such classics as Count Dracula and The Mummy. They dominated the horror film market and largely stuck to a successful formula of violence and sexual content. But with a filmography numbering in the hundreds during the most productive period, it's little wonder that they ended up turning to variations of the classics to keep things fresh. So as well as their nine Dracula films and sequels, they produced six other vampire-themed films, three of which were loosely based on the Carmilla story. The Vampire Lovers and Lust for a Vampire, both released in in 1970 were the first films to bring lesbian vampirism explicitly to the big screen. There are boobs, lusty fangs and a diaphanous dress, as well as irresistible seduction and the classic vampiric predation, all while being somewhat endearingly cringeworthy and uh, uh, very, very much of the time. 
Ultimately, it's these films that first made lesbian vampires sexy, and in doing so fed a fantasy shared by straight and sexually diverse people alike. The lesbian vampires had arrived and there was no putting them back in the coffin. From that moment on, the only way was up for the new sexy lesbian vampire trope. There was clearly a thirst for it, and almost every medium found a way to satisfy the new bloodlust. In feature films we have the explicitly lesbian hammer horrors of course, but there's subtext and hints to be found in earlier classics like The Brides of Dracula and Dracula's Daughter. Later on, things become a, a lot more explicit with the likes of lesbian vampire killers. In TV we see lesbian themes in shows like True Blood, Sanctuary, Buffy and the Vampire Diaries. And if vampire literature or video games float your boat, there are lesbian vampires to be found amongst them as well. Basically, if there's a vampire story to be told these days, making said vampire female and gay is the uh, go-to also original way to, to keep things fresh. In this way, vampire stories have seen unparalleled queer representation in almost every media format, even while in most other themes and characters have lagged behind. I mean, unfortunately that LGBTQ plus representation is all too often problematically sexualized. One might ask why vampires need to be sexy at all, like every other Halloween costume. I mean, after all, they started out as scary stories of walking corpses, so how on earth did we get to busty, beautiful, dominating women going around seducing every girl they can get their fangs on? Even though the lesbian vampire might be the most famous, it's certainly not the only time supernatural creatures have been sexualized. Poor things. There's a whole category of mythical half-humans dedicated to corrupting with their wiles, like the half-bird, half-woman sirens of ancient Greek mythology, who lured sailors to their deaths with their beautiful song. Or the demonic succubus, who appears in dreams to seduce women through sex in order to get their alternative body fluids they need to sustain them. If you know what I mean. I wish I didn't know what I meant. The thing is, these supernatural creatures of folklore all originally came about as a kind of cautionary tale. They were the monsters, the boogeymen, the women that would come and get you if you let your guard down. At the time that the mythical beasts were being conceived, sexuality itself was something to be feared as much as the monsters, so it makes sense that there were monstrous characters that blended the two for a double dose of shame and fear. Thankfully, times have changed and sex is no longer such a taboo subject. There was a point in the middle when sexiness was having its revolution. It was it was out there, but it was still shocking. And that's when it became particularly effective to take your traditionally grotesque monsters, like the bloated blood-sucking vampires, and turn them into equally scary, sexy seductresses. It just happened to coincide with Hammer Horror's lucrative decade of sexy monster movies, ensuring success for both the film company and the trope itself. These days, of course, even Hammer Horror won't cut it for us. There's so much other awfulness to pick from in the world, and the boogeymen and women of old just can't hold a candle to our modern worries. So vampires and other supernatural beings are no longer something to be feared at all. In fact, they're more like a comfort, a release into a fantasy world where we can immerse ourselves into the trials and tribulations of the Fae and not think about our own problems. In this new, evolved version of the trope, vampires are just another kind of people, and as such they can be loaded with all the usual people stuff, like identity crises, romantic liaisons and sexual awakenings, only with more fangs. So this is the uniquely human supernatural backdrop that's the setting for our modern gay, lesbian and bisexual vampires. Although whether that almost exclusively female homosexuality is championed just to add back into the shock factor and titillation for a largely desensitized audience, or to give genuine representation, still varies on a case-by-case -case basis. On one side of the coin you've got your blatantly provocative, sexy, lesbian fest designed primarily for a heterosexual audience, and on the other you've got reasoned and three-dimensional arguments for homosexuality amongst these supernatural beings. I think you can probably guess uh, which is the good, which is the bad representation there. Let's start with the bad. Lesbian Vampire Killers, which is not only a terrible film but also a horrendously problematic corruption of the genre. Critic Deborah Ross from The Spectator wrote, it's not even so bad it's good, it's so bad that at 87 minutes, it's probably a good 87 minutes too long, which is just, ah, the perfect way to describe it. Probably the biggest intrigue comes from actually trying to decode the title. I mean, are we going to meet vampire killers that happen to be lesbians? Or killers of vampire lesbians? Or vampires who kill lesbians? Never mind, it all becomes crystal clear. Set in the mysterious wilds of Norfolk in England, two men find themselves in a village in which all the girls have been cursed to become lesbian vampires on their 18th birthdays, because sure, the curse came from none other than ancient vampire, Queen Carmilla, who had descended 
landed on the village, killed the men and seduced the women before being vanquished herself. How do they have more children? Somehow I doubt this was a sequel to Carmilla that Sheridan and Lefanu imagined. What follows is supposed to be a classic comedy romp of lusty, bloodthirsty women and the hapless but accidentally brilliant men trying to overcome them. Um, I mean, which of course they eventually do, curing the women in the village of their vampirism, but curity not to their gayness. One critic wrote, The misogyny is too insistent to be ironic, despite the relatively small use of nudity and gore. The vampires, when splain, splurt milky white fluid rather than blood, which is a peculiarly unpleasant and telling detail. Did we need that? Apart from the obvious problematic representation of all lesbians as gorgeous women specifically tailored to appeal to the male gaze, there is the clear issue of tying together predatory vampirism with predatory lesbianism. To be turned into a vampire is also to be turned into a lesbian, so those who are doing the turning are to be feared on both counts. In the film's world, are all lesbians predatory in nature, just waiting in the shadows to spring out and turn an unsuspecting straight woman? Because vampires can't control their lust to bite, so really we shouldn't be expecting the lesbians to control themselves either? Why is everyone interested in girls who have literally just had their 18th birthday? I'm pretty sure if it was a child yesterday, it's a child today. No, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's morally right, does it? Anyway, well done to us for not turning every straight girl we see, I guess. By intrinsically linking the two, the implication is that vampirism and lesbianism go hand in hand as equal examples of moral decay. It's reinforcing an ignorant and homophobic view of all queer women. Although the ending of the film gives us strange mixed messages that the cured women are still gay, even when they're no longer vampires, could imply that their corrupted lesbianism is a curse worse than vampirism, with no known cure, putting them forever out of the reach of the men that crave them. Boo-hoo! Or could be spun to mean that the two are entirely separate, and in a more positive light, their gayness isn't something that needed to be cured, but was just innately within them all along. Maybe every woman in this village was gay all along. That's a nice take, but it odds with the very premise of this terrible film. It's almost as if, under the stereotypical surface of this frankly awful movie, there aren't actually any hidden depths at all. <laughs> Thankfully, although it may be the most blatant, the heterosexual titillation of lesbian vampires isn't the only way they're represented in the media. Those films and TV programs that choose to feature lesbian vampires as merely another facet of vampirehood, like the population in general, tend to be better thought out, leading to more healthy representations. Much of that healthy representation comes from just not being so overt about it, leaning more on subtle hints and the motivations behind being a gay vampire rather than just making them gay because you need a plot point. So. In early examples of cinema, this kind of representation tended to err on the side of the subtle, like with the 1936 sequel to Dracula, Dracula's Daughter. Although never explicit about the title character's romantic intentions, the interaction between a female vampire and her female victim is nevertheless laden with lustful looks and some un unnecessary undressing. The subject is there for anyone able to see it. And why does that matter? Because it means it was made for people who were able to read gay between the lines, and that's pretty special in the 1930s. Even some of the less overt Hammer vampire films, like Brides of Dracula from 1960, is spread thickly with queer subtext, although this time from the male protagonist, played by David Peel. In it, the casting, the colour scheme, and the all too familiar shame and exclusion felt by a protagonist strikes an unmistakable chord in the hearts of anyone who identifies as something other than cishet. Later, TV shows in particular take advantage of the move from monster to misunderstood myth to be more inclusive about the kinds of relationships the vampire next door might pursue. When you think about it, queerness, lesbianism, gayness, and bisexuality amongst vampires actually makes a lot of sense. Becoming a vampire means you're no longer bound to traditional, puritanical notions of human existence. You drink blood rather than eat food to sustain you. You sleep during the day and wake during the night. You can't have garlic, like, at all? Hmm. Relatable. So why should your sexuality be heteronormative? The extension of that argument is that the long life of notionally immortal vampires grants them the time and opportunity to try new things and really test themselves to discover who they really are. And after all, an immortal existence is going to get very dull if you're not open to trying new experiences. Plus, once you're a vampire, well, pretty much on the fringes of society now anyway, might as well be opening about those not-so-straight feelings you had previously. 
that's something we can actually connect back to our real life experiences when it comes to intersectionality, right? Often you'll find that if you take two groups, say one disabled, one non-disabled, there will be a higher incidence of people who are openly queer in the group of disabled people. Or you'll see that people with physical disabilities are more likely to seek help for their mental health or neurodivergence. Because we're already going against the grain, I mean, <laughs> what's one step more? Being a vampire allows you that sense of freedom. As long as it's for the vampire's sake, not just to titillate the males around her. One of my favourite episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer involves Willow, who is human, meeting an alternate universe version of herself, who is a vampire and also, as she says, I'm so evil, I'm so skanky and I think I'm kinda gay, after the latter hits on her, which is fascinating. <laughs> Please let me know in the comments if you would hit on an alternate universe version of yourself. I don't know if I would do that to me. When Buffy attempts to comfort her with, just remember, a vampire's personality has nothing to do with who they were before being turned. Angel, who is an actual vampire, Buffy and therefore knows stuff, intends to correct her with, well, actually, but is swiftly shot down. The show as a whole implies that all vampires are to some extent bisexual, due to a rather obvious metaphor of vampirism, meaning sexual predation and thus an attraction or desire is formed between sire and offspring regardless of sex. However, the degree of bisexuality is, as Angel points out, somewhat dependent on the person prior to being turned. Of course, when Willow later also follows her journey into being a witch and falls in love with Tara, another witch, we can again see that having that little extra something about a person that makes you feel different already leads you to being more open about expressing other things too. And it's always fun when someone misinterprets a vampire's hunger as a person coming onto them. Personally, I think that Buffy was really instrumental in subverting the vampire narrative turning scary supernatural monsters into real characters with real depth and backstory, something that's continued right up to the most modern vampire stories. Even so, these vampires the people do narratives don't always hit the mark and can fall foul of tokenism and the negative sides of queer coding. I mean, like in true blood. <laughs> the relationship between Tara and her maker Pam really doesn't go anywhere, like help with either character's development or actually be influential to the story like I think it might, but then, ah. Poor Pam though, rest in peace for her, uh, her character's happiness. So what does the future of the lesbian vampire trope look like? Well, if 2022's streaming service efforts are anything to go by, they're going to continue to lean away from pure titillation and towards character depth and development, but nevertheless struggle to find a firm footing in the modern media. First Kill was a series that debuted in June of 2022 and revolved around the lesbian relationship between newly realized vampire Juliet and legacy vampire hunter Cal. I know, I know, it's a tale as old as time, the vampire and the vampire hunter, but this time with lesbians. It was, it was a fresh take on the uh, the well trodden trope, with Juliet having no desire to be predatory towards anyone and instead just finding her love for Cal and, uh, enough to starve off the bloodlust. Spoiler. Um, it would have been lovely to see where this new and interesting approach took us, but it seems there's not to be because the show was cancelled in August after just one season. Because of course it was. Another 2022 release that was a big hit with streamers was the supernatural teen drama Wednesday, which features all of your classic paranormal beings with real teenager problems, including Cyber with self-esteem issues, werewolves having identity crises, and medusas who accidentally stone themselves in the mirror. Also, vampires. Although we don't actually see any lesbian vampires per se in the series, it does introduce gay characters in the mothers of Beak trolling Eugene. I mean, cool. They're featured in that matter-of-fact way that means the storyline doesn't need to revolve around their gayness. Um, I just kind of wish they had a bit more airtime to more firmly escape the gravitational pull of just a tokenism. The fact is, despite the long history and promising gothic start of lesbian vampirism, the queer community is still facing an uphill battle for healthy representation in this intrinsically troubled trope. Perhaps ultimately, that's the real cautionary tale for the modern age. I mean, RIP to first kill though. Like, <laughs> wow, I'm just offended that they cancelled it, really. Who made that choice? Also rude that my wife wouldn't watch it with me. She won't watch Buffy with me either. Real horror is trying to navigate the contradiction between classical monster and modern sexuality. It's enough to give anyone the heebie-jeebies. A special thank you to the members of the Kelvin Fozard Club. You absolute angels, not demons. Wait, what's the opposite of a vampire? Yeah, that metaphor wasn't going anywhere well. <laughs> no, never mind. Thank you. If you'd like to become a member of the Hogan Bozard Club, all you have to do is click the join button down below. You will also receive access to a monthly behind the scenes video as well with all the other videos that have previously 
come before and my goodness there are quite a few now wow i think and i think i've been doing this for four years it's been a while thank you so much for watching i hope you really enjoyed this video um if you are new here please do hit subscribe love to have you around was that last night Ooh. With the toddler who started having nightmares. And I shall see you in my next video. Bye bye.